Hello, uh, welcome to this Biochemical Society and Portland Press uh, webinar, which is part of the Biochemistry Focus webinar series. Um, there are a variety of uh, webinars in this series around molecular bioscience, as well as practical uh, sessions on career support uh, and career development. Um, the organization welcomes suggestions for future topics and uh, speech speakers to feature in the webinar series. Just have a look on the website uh, for more details. My name is Roger Cox. Um, I lead the gen Genetics of Type 2 Diabetes Group at MRC Harwell in Oxfordshire. Uh, today's webinar is titled Obesity from Genes to Biochemistry of a Global uh, to Gene from Genes to Biochemistry of a Global Epi uh, Pandemic. Um, our speakers today are Nick uh, Morton and Catherine Kentis. Um, this is an important topic. There are more than uh, 1.9 billion people, at least in 2017, who were overweight and obese in the world, resulting in, in over 4 million excess deaths. Um, obesity is a major risk factor for COVID-19. Um, and there's limited success in lifestyle interventions and uh, a limited set of drugs available for treating obesity, which only leaves, leaves uh, invasive surgery for severe obesity. Um, Today, today's uh, talks will focus on research around the genetic extremes of body weight. Uh, these are population uh, level analyses, um, exploiting the UK biobank resource of uh, imaging and uh, metabolic markers. And um, we'll hear about uh, using these resources to uh, map and identify novel adiposity genes. Uh, and in particular, a number of genes that are involved in the extracellular matrix of adipose tissue. Um, we'll also hear about uh, how, how combining tract tractable animal models with large scale human genetics approaches can re reveal interesting new biochemical pathways and uh, can be exploited for novel obesity therapeutics. Um, just before I introduce uh, Nick, our first uh, speaker, um, I've been asked to draw attention to the uh, Biochemical Society uh, Journal uh, Clinical Science, uh, which is Paul and Press. Um, the journal publishes original papers um, in in a variety of uh, bioscience areas, as well as uh, state of the art reviews by experts in the field. Um, there are various open access options for this uh, journal, and uh, there's a special collection in adipose biology and cardiometabolic metabolic disease. If you'd like to have a look at that. Um, there's going to be a new call shortly for uh, cardiovascular oncology. So if you're interested in contributing to that, get in touch uh, with the journal at editorial at portlandpress.com. OK, as we, as we get on with the uh, webinar, uh, we'll take questions at the end. Um, so please put your questions in the uh, questions box as we go along, uh, and then we'll uh, select questions from there to ask at the end of the, of the two presentations. Our first speaker today is Nick Morton. Uh, Nick is Chair of Molecular Metabolism at the Centre for Cardiovascular Science, University of Edinburgh, and his work addresses the genetic and biochemical basis of obesity and leanness mechanisms, uh, including a preclinical in vivo physiology modelling of, of candidate genes. Um, the Morton Lab has been leveraging gen uh, genetic extremes of obesity in, in mouse divergent selection models uh, to identify new pathways uh, regulating fat mass and metabolic health. So I'll hand over now to Nick. Okay. So um, thanks very much, Roger, for for the introduction, and, and thanks to Sandra Matz and Ellie Davis of the and the Biochemical Society for for organising the, the webinar. It's, it's great to have a chance to to talk about some of our, our work up, up here in Edinburgh, as you can see in the in the background. I think the the title of this slide really captures the situation that we're in uh, very graphically. So uh, obesity has been described as a catastrophe in slow motion. And, and I've, I've kind of stolen that quote from another uh, global catastrophe, um, global warming. So I'm making comparisons to some very impactful things that face uh, society. And I think if we just look at some of the numbers, and Roger's kind of touched on some of these, we can see over the last 40 years that there's been a, a tripling in the prevalence of obesity, and that this is associated with 
billions of pounds, euros or dollars in, in health and healthcare costs. And uh, my figure from the World Health Organization uh, showed that there was 2.8 million excess deaths per year uh, back in 2017. And this was before COVID, which we know uh, has an additional impact on, on uh, health and survival. And there are a few effective treatments, as Roger has mentioned, uh, the only really effective one being invasive bariatric surgery. And so there's real uh, a real um, need for, for doing further research in this area. And the projections out to 2025, I'll let you read that yourself, are pretty dire. So really there's an onus on us, I think, to, to understand the mechanisms underpinning obesity and try to find new therapeutic avenues that might help us uh, impact on, on this uh, current global pandemic. And so one way of doing that is to understand the genetic mechanisms underpinning obesity. And interestingly, over the last, over the same time period, the last 40 years, there's been an exponential increase in our understanding of the genes or the genetics that contribute to adiposity. And as, as Catherine will cover later on, there's maybe over a thousand loci that have been associated with adiposity uh, traits in, in humans. Add that to the hundreds and thousands of genes found in, in uh, animal models, uh, you'd really think we'd be getting somewhere uh, in terms of tackling uh, new therapeutic avenues from this. But actually, despite the huge investment and, and a lot of work, um, even if you combine the, the human genes we know that contribute to the, the main adiposity phenotype, we understand a very small proportion of what we know is a very heritable uh, disease and trait in humans. And it's pretty clear that obesity is, is genetic. And so this, uh, these two pictures, one on, on, on your left, is a picture, a famous picture from the cover of Nature 1994 from Jeff Friedman's lab, showing that a mouse that has lost the gene that encodes a, an adipocyte secreted hormone leptin becomes uh, catastrophically obese. And importantly, Sadaf Faruqi and Steve Riley showed that this translated faithfully into the same kind of syndrome in humans that lacked leptin. And that can be reversed with the administration of the missing hormone. So the important thing here is that uh, mouse uh, biology can inform very faithfully and closely into human biology. And that's why we use uh, animal models uh, as a way of getting an insight into, into human conditions and mechanisms. But the leptin deficiency and others like it are very rare severe obesity mutations. And we can get insight into the genetic contribution to our body shape from, again, a special case, but maybe a more common case, and that is twins. And we can see here that uh, monozygotic twins that have identical DNA have a very similar body shape in the top uh, picture there, whereas fraternal twins that share the same amount of DNA as you might with your brother or sister have a very different body shape. And this is very strong evidence that our body shape is determined by our genes. But again, special cases and rare mutations don't really give us an insight into the population level genetic contribution to adiposity. And Catherine will cover this later, but uh, this is something that is now uh, moving at pace. But uh, until recently, we didn't really have good insights into fat distribution and fat content in humans. And so we quite often rely on using animal models and the powerful genetic approaches we can apply to animal models to gain insight into genes that contribute to uh, adiposity. And that's what my team have done in collaboration with uh, Seymour Horvath and Lutz Bunger over the years, who developed artificial selection lines to push the genetic extremes of adiposity. An example I will give is the polygenic lean and fat lines of mice. And these were created by a three-way cross between three different mouse lines, one outbred to inbred. And those mice were selectively bred for over 60 generations on divergent phenotypes of fatness. And uh, more importantly, or, or as importantly, uh, they were maintained with a stable lean mass. So we're re really looking at a selective uh, divergence in adiposity here. And, and to give you an insight into the power and scope of that experiment, uh, if this was done in humans, it would be a bit like when the Romans left Britain about 1600 years ago for whatever reason. And uh, some evil feudal lord took over and uh, enforced a sort of mating so that only heavy people could mate with heavy people and lean people with lean people until the present day. So that's how powerful the experiment actually is that we're working with the phenotypes at the end. And so luckily, uh, Simon Horbat had done a lot of the genetics uh, in these animals crossing the fat and lean lines into an F2 generation and looking for the chromosome regions underpinning the divergence in adiposity. So we knew the genetic regions responsible, and importantly, they were not associated with some of these single severe mutations such as leptin and agouti. So this is a fertile ground for finding me uh, novel mechanisms contributing to divergent adiposity in these lines. And we decided to look at differential gene expression as a candidate gene approach in the adipose tissue between these two lines of mice 
to take that forward uh, given the selection criteria with which they were created. And so if we look at a schematic of that approach, we wanted to narrow down uh, adipose causality genes for divergence in adiposity. And we had to give them certain criteria to fit so that they would made, made, uh, remain uh, as plausible candidate genes. First of all, the change in gene expression must be selective only for the adipose tissue, and the change wouldn't happen in non-adipose tissues like liver, muscle, and kidney. Second of all, they must fall within the chromosomal intervals that Simone had described as being the major contributors to the divergence in the phenotype. Third, they had to be responsive to a dietary intervention, and in our case, we uh, used chronic high fat feeding to induce obesity and diabetes and see how they responded. And uh, they also had to be uh, conserved across species, including humans preferably, different strains of mice, and have genetic uh, underlying variants that would explain the difference in gene expression. And finally, they would have to pass a functional validation test, and in our case, that is making a transgenic animal to model the overexpression or the difference in expression between the original lines. And so a summary of that data over a number of studies is shown here where we, sh we found about a dozen genes that were selectively up in the adipose tissue of the fat line of mice. And, and some of those had been shown before in other models quite reassuringly, and others we provided some evidence for a functional effect in adipose tissue. But perhaps most strikingly, we found that only one gene, thiosulfate sulfur transferase in chromosome 15, was highly upregulated in the adipose tissue of the lean line of mice. And so we immediately saw the potential for this as being a candidate causal leanness gene, which gave us a, as an alternative approach to the obesity uh, question, an alternative approach potentially to therapeutics. And so we, we modelled this in mice. We, we overexpressed TST in the adipose tissue selectively of mice and fed them a high fat diet. And we found that, as you can see in the purple broken line, those mice resisted weight gain and fat gain on, when they were fed a high fat diet. And there's two explanations for that. One is that they might be lipodystrophic, unable to put on fat, and that would be unhealthy, or they were lean and healthy, as we hypothesized. And so to test that, we, we come to some of the biochemistry and physiology that we apply to our candidate genes. And in the first instance, we performed indirect calorimetry to measure gas exchange in these animals. So measuring oxygen consumption and carbon dioxide production allows us to determine how many calories and what kind of calories these animals are burning. So we can determine carbohydrate versus lipid metabolism, for, for example, with the respiratory exchange ratio. And we can also measure food intake, water intake, and uh, physical activity using the infrared beams uh, around the side of the cage. And what the data showed us is that the mice overexpressing TST in their adipose tissue, shown in the, the pink candy stripe bars here, had higher oxygen consumption. And this translated into a reduced respiratory exchange ratio, which indicated increased fat burning in the animals overexpressing TST in their fat. And this was associated with increased fat oxidation in the liver of these animals. So overexpressing TST in the adipose tissue had a distant beneficial effect on fat oxidation in the liver. And we next tested the glucose homeostasis in these animals, and we employed a euglycemic hyperinsulinic clamp method, where we try to maintain glucose levels consistently here whilst infusing glucose at a variable rate under a high insulin. And we can see from the right-hand side uh, line here in purple dash, that our animals of expressing TST require a higher rate of glucose infusion. In other words, they are insulin sensitized. And this translated into increased glucose uptake in the uh, muscle and adipose tissue of the animals. So they were metabolically protected with having uh, overexpression of TST in their adipose tissue. Okay, so to cut a very long story short, uh, we discovered genetically that TST is an adipose tissue lean gene. And uh, this is a nuclear encoded uh, protein which is expressed in the mitochondria. Mechanistically, we showed that this was associated with a reduction in the uh, gaseous signaling molecule sulfide and a reduction in reactive oxygen species. And this led to an improvement in metabolic health and mitochondrial health and function that translated into increased insulin sensitization, maintained lipolytic capacity, improved hormone release from the adipose tissue, and increased oxidation in distant peripheral tissues. Importantly, we also found that humans, uh, lean humans, had higher levels of TST in their adipose tissue, showing that there was indeed some translational angle here going from the mouse to the, to the humans. And this suggested that TST may be uh, a useful therapeutic target and an anti-diabetic target for, for humans. And so we've taken this further. We have uh, used a, a substrate for TST that was discovered more than 80 years ago when TST was first identified as, as a, an enzyme involved in the detoxification of cyanide. And so we took this compound, it's called thiosulfate, and we fed it to 
uh, diabetic animals, and we showed that we could reduce their thirst and we could reduce their urine footprint, as you can see in the picture on the top right here, animals given thiosulfate essentially urinated less. And these are two hallmarks of diabetes that were improved with treatment with the TST activator compound. We also showed that those animals became more sensitive to insulin and they had reduced levels of uh, a marker of chronic hyperglycemia, HbA1c, which suggests that treating these animals with a TST activator was protecting them against diabetes. And we've taken that forward uh, with Rod Carter and my collaborator and hepatologist Jonathan uh, Fallowfield in Edinburgh under a Diabetes UK grant. So this is something we're actively working on now. But it's not really just about uh, translation. I mean, it's exciting to find novel targets that we can work with. But as a scientist and a biochemist, I was really curious about how TST had popped out of this study. What, what is the evolutionary significance of TST and why was it high in the adipose tissue? And this is pure speculation, but, but why not have, have a little bit of fun? Uh, it's important to, to realize that Billions of years ago, uh, life existed a bit like this picture here. So we had microorganisms uh, living on hydrothermal vents that were respiring on this gaseous signaling molecule I mentioned, sulfide. There was no oxygen in the atmosphere, but they survived just fine by respiring on sulfide. And to this day, complex organisms such as lugworms living on intertidal flats will respire on sulfide. If you go to these places, you'll be able to smell sulfur. But what would a mammal be doing having high levels of TST, which we know is involved in the detoxification of sulfide and cyanide? So if you permit me to speculate, uh, we suggest that TST may be a, a hard foraging gene. Uh, and the story would go that uh, this little mammal during periods of food insecurity would have to eat alternative food sources, such as these nice and juicy, but highly poisonous berries that contain cyanogenic glycosides and other cyanogenic compounds. And only by having high levels of TST might that animal survive that period of food insecurity and go on to, to pass its genes on to the next generation. And maybe it could co-opt TST function into metabolism uh, and, and improve metabolic health uh, incidentally alongside detoxifying toxic compounds. Now, there might be a lesson in this for human biology because, as I mentioned before, TST levels are high in the adipose tissue of lean humans and low in the adipose tissue of obese humans. But what if you had a double whammy uh, with an environmental insult of increased cyanogen exposure if you had low levels of TST and you were obese. And so an example of that might be through cigarette smoke, but we also are exposed to high levels of cyanogenic compounds in some of our foodstuffs. Some cultures eat high amounts of cassava and lima beans, for example. So it's not completely far-fetched and it's a speculation that we'd be keen to, to follow up. So having discovered TST as a as a potential lean gene, uh, we obviously wanted to work further into the biochemistry and biology of this new enzyme involved in mammalian metabolism. And we, we knocked out the gene and looked at the phenotype of these animals. And indeed, as you might expect, we found that mice lacking TST were uh, sensitive to uh, developing diabetes. And we can see here knockout animals lacking TST in red when given a bolus of pyruvate create more glucose from their liver. And they also have liar, uh, higher levels of gluconeogenesis in their liver to begin with. And this might promote diabetes. We also know that they have a higher respiration rate in their mitochondria. And we think this is because they're compensating by trying to detoxify the high levels of sulfate that they're exposed to. They also exhibit low insulin secretion in response to glucose. So they have a suppressed insulin secretory profile, which would be pro-diabetogenic. Again, the opposite as you'd find in the animal overexpressing TST in its adipose tissue. And finally, more recent data has shown us that they have a, a skewed microbiome. And they have higher uh, levels of aparvulum, which has been linked to a pro-diabetogenic phenotype. So all of these things would suggest that if you lack TST, you miss out on this beneficial effect of, of uh, metabolizing sulfide in a normal way, and it's pro-diabetogenic. But as you can imagine, biology is never quite as straightforward as that. And we've, we've since crossed our TST knockout animals with mice that are prone to atherosclerosis, the, the apple E mice. And we've measured lesions in the aortic arches of these mice. And we actually find that mice lacking TST are protected from atherosclerosis. And they also have improved vessel dilation. So if we take out the aortic rings and string them between two little Newtonian force measurement uh, forceps, we can see that if we give them a vasodilator like acetylcholine, they actually relax more readily. And so this is consistent with the, the vasoprotective and vascular protective effects of sulfide. But clearly, there's a kind of Jekyll and Hyde going on here with, with TST deficiency. And it could mean that we need to have tissue-specific interventions if it's ever going to be a therapeutic target in terms of inhibiting the enzyme's function. 
So just to close off, because I could spend more time on the biochemistry of this exciting uh, compound and, and, and an enzyme system, is, is that genetic discovery of a potential adipose tissue lean gene has unlocked a novel biochemistry that impacts upon mammalian metabolism that has therapeutic potential, but it may require uh, tissue-specific targeting if we want to inhibit the enzyme system. And so I would just like to end there by, by thanking key members of my team. Uh, the TST team are all are shown here above, and, and in particular, help uh, you know thank Simon Horvat and Lutz Bunger for their development and, and, and collaboration on the artificial selection lines. And here's a recent picture of the team. We can see Rod, Alistair, and Tongi are, are, are highlighted in a red circle here. Their thanks uh, for their work on TST through the years. And we're now going to move on to, to Catherine, uh, as you will see, who's going to tell you all about uh, an alternative approach using human genetics to understand uh, adiposity. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Nick. That was very interesting and exciting. Um, we're now going to take the uh, second uh, talk of this webinar, and we'll take all the questions at the end. So keep putting them in the questions box so that they uh, pile up and we can choose some at the end. So I'd like to introduce uh, Catherine Kentestu. Uh, Catherine is an MRC-funded research fellow at the University of Edinburgh and is interested in genetic drivers of body composition. Um, she's working with population level data and combines genetic and imaging data sets to identify genomic regions that associate with um, different adiposity pan patterns in humans. So she's going to talk about those discoveries uh, today. So I'll hand over now to Catherine. Great, thank you, Roger. Um, can you see my screen? Yes, we can see your slides. Thank you very much. Perfect, thank you. Um, okay. Hi all, uh, thank you for tuning in. Uh, as Roger said, I'm Catherine, and today I'll be talking about the work that I've done here in Edinburgh during my PhD, so over the past four years, uh, which looks at the genetic underpinnings of human adiposity and taking gene candidates from their GWAS gene discovery um, to their functional characterization. Uh, so in the sort of opposite perspective to the work that Nick just described. Also, I want to make a quick disclaimer that this work is currently unpublished, so I've, I've omitted a few sensitive pieces of information, but if anything is unclear, please ask at the end. Um, so obesity is an important public health concern, as uh, the other speakers covered, and more than 600 million people, adults worldwide, are obese. As Roger said before, um, in 2017, 4 million deaths were attributable to carrying excess weight and caused by obesity comorbidities, such as heart disease, diabetes and cancer. The COVID-19 pandemic has brought many societal health inequities into focus and obesity is one of them. And it's been shown that uh, while obesity is only defined by having a body mass index or BMI above 30 kilos per meter squared, we know that the way that fat is distributed through the body can also directly affect disease risk. Adipose tissue distribution can generally be grouped into these two patterns, pear-shaped and apple-shaped adiposity, as you can see in this figure here. The former being when there is an excess of subcutaneous fat, particularly on the lower half of the body, and the latter when there is visceral fat accumulation, particularly around and inside the intra-abdominal organs. Apple-shaped obesity confers a much higher disease risk than pear-shaped obesity. Uh, for heart disease and diabetes. And there is also now emerging evidence for visceral fat being an independent risk factor for critical illness in COVID patients. Importantly for my work, both of these types of body shape have been shown to be heritable. Thus, identifying the genetic contributors towards these body composition trends might lead us to disease prevention insights. Genome-wide association studies, or GWAS for short, have been a useful tool in identifying genomic regions that associate with traits of interest at a population level. So far, large-scale GWAS of obesity have focused on assaying simple and um, easily accessible anthropometric phenotypes, such as BMI, which don't really require specialist equipment to be measured. The problem is that BMI, for example, while being a quite specific tool, has low sensitivity, meaning that it can often misrepresent uh, body fat content and location so it cannot differentiate between different adipose tissue distribution patterns. Thankfully, large population cohorts that can be used in a GWAS context have started performing whole body imaging on their participants. The cohort I have been working with is called UK Biobank and consists of 500,000 participants from across the UK. And for these participants, there are over 2,000 2, phenotypes that have been gathered. And these include physical measures, blood biochemistry, questionnaire data, and of course, their DNA information. 
sadly, when my work took place out of these 500,000 uh, 500, people, DEXA scans were only available for 5,000 participants. DEXA scans are um, the scans of my choice because as opposed to MRIs and CT scans, they offer a whole body quantification of fat and lean mass as opposed to single slice images. And they do so over six body regions, over the android and gynoid area, um, the arms, uh, legs, trunk, and total body areas. And using a composition of these regions, we can extrapolate the body shape of an individual and the amount of visceral fat that they may carry. You can see here two examples of DEXA scans for someone who is pear-shaped on the left and then someone who is apple-shaped on the right. And these individuals are matched in every aspect other than their body shape. The problem with DEXA scans and with imaging in general is that it's very expensive to do both monetarily and also in terms of manpower, uh, especially in large population cohorts. So the UK Bybank cohort for me looked something like this. It was very large overall, but the DEXA, compos uh, the DEXA body composition phenotypes that I was interested in were only available for a very small subset of the cohort. However, anthropometric phenotypes, such as height, weight, BMI, waist and hip circumference, were available for the entirety of the UK Biobank cohort. So while these are perhaps a bit crude, they do provide proxies for body composition and adipose tissue distribution. So I use them in a linear model framework to try and predict the DEX adiposity phenotypes onto the rest of the cohort. And this predicted the DEX adiposity measures quite well. Overall, um, the imputed DEXA phenotypes, which I'll now call IDEXA for imputed DEXA, predicted the measured DEXA ones with 81% accuracy. You can see here an example for the predictions of fat mass in the android area separately for men and women. <clears throat> so then I proceeded to perform GWAS on the IDEXA phenotypes for all 500,000 participants in UK Biobank, but excluding the ones that were used in the prediction models. This resulted in a major increase in discovery power and thousands of genome-wide significant loci. You can see here a comparison of the Manhattan plots for the aggregate DEXA traits in the inner circle in, in red, and then for the imputed IDEXA traits in the outer circle in blue. After filtering these loci for novelty and for discoverability in other phenotypes, I collaborated with cohorts that had actual DEXA measured in their participants to try and replicate some of these uh, genetic associations. In doing so, we gathered the total DEXA replication cohort of 18,000 participants, in which I attempted to replicate all of the loci that were sufficiently powered to be detectable in this much smaller cohort. Out of the 27 SNPs that we tried to replicate, six replicated successfully, while 19 out of 27 had directionally consistent effects between discovery and replication, uh, validating the phenotype uh, prediction approach. Out of the six replicated loci, today I'll be talking to you about one in particular, which for the purposes of this talk, we'll call the MMPX locus. Okay. The first thing I did was to show that the MMPX gene was indeed the, a strong causal gene candidate at this locus. I did so using the GTEx gene expression data alongside Mojiwa summer statistics and a couple of different statistical methods. In doing so, I showed that there is an increase in leg fat mass and also an increase in MMPX expression per copy of the GWAS effect allele, which would mean that the anticipated effect of a null mutation in MMPX would be reduced adiposity. Um, matrix metalloproteinase genes, or MMP genes in general, are modifiers of the extracellular matrix, or ECM, and they alter the availability of ECM components quite often in a very tissue-specific way. Many of them also have well-established roles in developmental processes, such as body composition. A good example from the literature of a, an MMP gene that affects mammalian body composition is MT1 MMP. As a protein, it takes part in the proteolytic degradation of collagen 1 fibers. And it has been shown that mice with no mutations in this gene are essential, which uh, causes the ACM to be very dense and fibrotic and dysfunctional, um, as you can see in the bottom images here. Um, so it impairs normal depogenic development. Now, when it came to the MMPX gene itself, it codes for a peptidase of fibrillar collagen, um, sort of opposite to the example we just saw. The MMPX protein cleaves pro-collagen fibers and facilitates their maturation and the formation of collagen polymers. <clears throat> 
the hypothesis I formed around MMPX and the GWAS signal was that uh, MMPX can alter the availabil availability of mature collagen in an adipose-specific manner during ECM reorganization, thereby regulating canonical mammalian adipogenesis. To try and understand how it might do so in an anatomically similar model, we obtained mice that have null mutations in MMPX and sought to metabolically uh, phenotype them under obesogenic conditions. The first thing I did was to expose a cohort of wild type and null mice to a high fat diet for a period of just over three months. When looking at their weight gain uh, over the 13 weeks, uh, you can see here that the MMPX knockout cohort in green was more resistant to weight gain than the wild type controls in beige. Quite strikingly, I also saw that the homozygous null mice were hyperphagic both before and after the high fat diet, the latter of which you can see here. Um, on the top figures here on the left, you can see food consumption for the two genotype groups measured every 15 minutes over a 24 hour period. And then on the right, you can see the average measurements over the day and night phases. And then the same trend uh, can be seen for their energy expenditure in the bottom graphs here. Then in the middle, we're looking at the respiratory exchange ratio, which as Nick mentioned before, is an index of how many carbohydrates or lipids they use um, for fuel. Um, and we can see that after the high fat diet treatment, the null mice have a higher RER than the wild types. All of this taken together and alongside the weight gain resistance um, indicates that the MMPX uh, knockout animals have an increased metabolic rate. There wasn't much to explain this phenotype at an anatomical level and the MMPX knockout mice were almost indistinguishable when compared to the wild type controls, as you can see here. However, when we looked at their adipose tissue, we saw distinct histomorphology. The MMPX knockout mice had proportionately, proportionately fewer small adipocytes, which would be supportive of the hypothesis that in the absence of MMPX, collagen maturation is impaired, and the ECM becomes more pliable and more facilitating to adipocyte hypertrophy. There's a lot more work that we need to do to understand the molecular basis of this phenotype in the MMPX knockout mice. However, another important finding of this work was the sheer number of loci from the IDEXA GWAS that include other metalloproteinase genes. Each of these proteins takes part in extracellular matrix remodeling in a slightly different way. So the ultimate goal would be to understand if, how, and when each of these genes might exert an effect on adipose tissue expansion both within physiological developmental processes and also in a pathogenic disease context. So to summarize, I started this work by imputing the whole body DEXA deposited phenotypes from a small subgroup of UK Biobank onto the rest of the cohort, doing so with 81% predictive efficacy. This means that my effective IDEXA G was sample size was just over 390,000 participants. After filtering the genome-wide significant signals for novelty and discoverability, I attempted replication of the strongest signals in independent DEXA cohorts. After performing colocalization analyses at the successfully replicated loci, I followed the strongest uh, gene candidate in the mouse model carrying null mutations in the GWAS causal gene. The MMPX knockout mouse were resistant to weight gain on a high fat diet and exhibited altered energy um, homeostasis, the molecular causes of which remain largely unknown for now. However, this work provides proof of principle for identifying novel and validated gene drivers of adiposity using imputed imaging phenotypes and will hopefully lead to more interesting biology in future. And with that, I'd like to thank the Medical Research Council for funding me in this work and my teammates and collaborators for their help. Thank you for listening and thanks to the Biochemical Society for having us today. Uh, we'll take questions, but I'm also happy to chat via email. Thank you. Thanks very much, Catherine. That was a great talk. Um, please keep the questions coming. I can see them in the uh, in the questions box, um, and we'll 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 go to uh, questions now. Now that uh, Nick's back on back on the screen, um, let's see. So there's a question here from uh, Kaylee uh, Scott, um, who asks. Um, Nick, do you know if TSD affects vascular function, fear its effects through adipose, e.g. decreased ROS? So is there an effect on vascular function that you've been able to measure? 
So the, the, the work we've done in the vasculature has all been done in the global knockout. So we cannot yet distinguish between the effects of TST deficiency, which leads to elevated sulphide and a beneficial vascular effect. Um, we think because of the increased systemic sulphide, but we have developed models where we have a, a vascular endothelial cell specific knockout, and those studies are currently ongoing. So hopefully we'll be able to give an answer to that once these studies have been done. It's the work of Tongi Bleo and, and all that I highlighted in the picture. So it's a good question, thanks. Um, good, thank you. Um, so uh, a question here for uh, from P. Trahern. Um, they're asking about the energy expenditure in the TSD mice. Uh, and whether uh, expressing the data as per animal rather than per kilogram would be more appropriate. So it's sort of a technical question about um, how you normalize uh, energy expenditure. Um, white adipose tissue having a lower energy expenditure per unit wild type than lean tissues is part of that question. So that's a, a common question yeah. in, in energy expenditure circles in the mass. <laughs> So thank, thanks for that, that question. Yeah, I mean, we, however we analyze that data, uh, it seems to be consistent with the other phenotypes in the animal, which is increased uh, lipid oxidation. That's that's the answer I would, I would give to that. But yeah, I mean, it's a fair point. I wanted to ask in terms of the, the mechanism of TST in, in, the, in the mitochondria, um, th this is an effect on, on ROS, production is it and then through ROS signaling to to other pathways is that is that what you think is happening yeah so we we, we do have some evidence that it's involved in TST is involved in quenching ROS and, and other people have published uh, direct evidence for it being involved in that process but actually most of our work has taken us down the route of sulfide metabolism uh, our strongest phenotypes come from looking at how uh, TST deficiency overexpression affects persulfidation of, of other proteins. Uh, unfortunately, I couldn't go into a lot of detail just given 15 minutes, uh, but one of the slides that I removed was, was looking at how TST directly uh, transfers sulfate and sulfur to target proteins. And so in, in the TST knockout, for example, you have elevated sulfide systemically, which causes persulfidation post-translational modification of a number of proteins kind of generally in the cell, but then TST has its own kind of profile of target proteins and so you have a deficiency in persulfidation in those and so we think there's a signature profile of TST deficiency uh, which uh, impacts upon persulfidation which is how sulfide mediates its post-translational effect. So we haven't done as much uh, on, on, uh, on ROS, direct effects of TST on ROS quenching but there is evidence from others that it, that it does happen. Thank you. Um, here's a question from Francois uh, Kumanov. Um, how does TST knockout affect insulin stimulated glucose uptake in the adipose tissue of these mice and the GLUT4 translocation? Um, so we had a look at glucose uptake specifically in adipose tissue and, and, and looking at GLUT4 translocation. Yeah, so we've seen, we haven't looked at translocation, but we do have evidence that there's elevated levels of GLUT4 uh, in the adipose tissue. Thanks. Um, let's find a question for Catherine. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, Richard Webb says, um, I've published that the MMP9, another metallic endoprotease, um, expression is inversely proportional to exercise. Uh, please can you comment on the relevance of this to obesity? Um, has it been clarified if that's in humans or in mice? I'm not uh, familiar not with this publication. Yeah, okay. Uh, it doesn't say um, in the question. So um, we did. You, yeah, go on. We did also see um, an activity difference in our knockout mice. Um, again, I'm not sure if he was referring to humans or mice, but we saw increased activity in our MMPX knockouts um, pre high fat diet exposure. Of course, after the high fat diet, none of the mice really moved very much. Um, Hope that helps. Okay, well, thank you very much. Um, so there's another uh, question here relating to energy expenditure in the MMPX knockout mice from uh, David Carling. Um, how is the energy dissipated? Is it through increased thermogenesis, brown or white fat? Uh, 
Um, that's a good question, and we were hoping to do um, more experiments to try and figure out um, exactly how this increased energy expenditure happens. Um, unfortunately, at the moment, um, it's largely impossible to do the work we're planning. Um, but I can say that in terms of anatomical differences, there's no gross changes um, in their brown fat or their white adipose tissue that can be that are microscopically discernible. Okay, thank you. Um, there's a question here from Emma Morris to uh, both of you. Have either of you looked at the changes in bone marrow adiposity, or is all the work focused on white fat? Do you, you want to go first, Nick? Sure. Uh, it's a quick answer. No, we haven't. Um, we haven't looked at, at viral adipose tissue uh, for for TST expression. If if it's TST, uh, you, you're asking about. Okay. Yeah, I, have, I haven't looked at it either. Um, for most of our mice, I assume for the TST as well, um, we do get some measurements for um, differences in bone mass. I'm not from the TDNMR analysis. I'm not mm. sure if that could indicate anything about uh, marrow adipose tissue, but it would be interesting. Yeah, I guess you'd have to look histologically um, mm -hmm. inside the bone um, of what's happening to adipocytes. Um, you mentioned uh, collagen uh, remodeling, Catherine. Have you looked at any uh, any coll collagen in, in your model? So have you looked you know, fluorescently or in any other way to, to see if there is remodeling going on or any differences perhaps if you culture these cells? So I did picrocereous red staining um, on sections from the mice at the end of the high fat diet experiment and there isn't any large difference that is perceived between the two genotypes, um, but perhaps something um, a little bit more detailed might show some difference. But in terms of um, sectioning, no, no different scene. Okay. Um, John Whitehead asks, uh, did either of you uh, have the opportunity to analyze the dipokine profiles and were there any atypical changes in lean or obese states? I guess leptin and adenectin, those sorts of things. Uh, so, so yeah, I mean, we published, hmm. yeah, we, we published in the TST again. It was just through lack of time um, that they had elevated uh, adiponectin secretion, and we think that was part of the uh, contributing to the phenotype. Uh, leptin was went along with fat mass change, um, but we didn't do an extensive workup on other adipokines. Okay. So a question here from Sophie Prosselock. Um, she says, hi, Nick, uh, thanks for your talk. Uh, do you think that your observed effects on metabolic control through TST could be linked to the anti-diabetic effects reported following the dietary intake of small thiosulfate compounds, such as uh, Sasco, I'm not sure what that is, found in foods such as onion and garlic? Um, you addressed that a little bit with some of the, some of the other food stuffs that you mentioned, but yeah. Yeah, so, so some of these will be toxic and some of them will be, so So we, we work with a garlic compound in, in the manuscript, in the paper, called 2PTS, uh, which is again derived from, from, from garlic, and that was, this was a TST inhibitor. We just used it as a tool to, to probe the effects of TST on the mitochondrial function, but I certainly think that there are uh, some potential TST activators, strangely enough, developed by the American military who are working on uh, cyanide detoxification programs when we first come, came across this. So there is there is scope there for using related compounds from, from onions and garlic that might uh, act as more selective TST activators than, than thiosulfate, which is a substrate. Okay. Um, so there's a question here from Mihaela Gusikov. Uh, um, Thinking about diabetes in the context of aging and also the increase of body weight with age, I was wondering how the expression of the TST gene is affected by age. Yeah. Uh, so it seems to be that the older and fatter we get, the lower your TST will be. Uh, that, that seems to be the, the general finding. So there's some recent uh, human work out there now showing that obesity is also associated with elevated sulfide. 
the, the ways that sulfide is measured are, are debated. Uh, so again, that needs to be uh, validated. Uh, but the work of Jose Manuel Fernandez Real and uh, Girona has shown that uh, sulfide is, is, is up in morbidly obese humans. And TST seems to go down, uh, which which would fit if if adipose TST is is considered to be contributing to circulating sulfide levels. Okay. Um, so Taryn Smith asked a sort of wider question around you know, what is the link between obesity in relation with the microbiome? So mm. how is the microbiome thought to influence obesity? What's the link? Yeah, so, so again, I don't work on this and, and I know that it can be considered a bit of a minefield uh, in terms of how how it all works, but it, you know, short chain fatty acid production by by microbes that cross through into the circulation and affect insulin sensitivity and central mechanisms, even energy expenditure have been shown by others. So I think there is a fair amount of evidence that that, that can happen uh, at least in rodents. Whether whether that translates into humans is I think something which is currently under debate and research. Thank you, um, Catherine. I was wondering um, how much overlap you you found with uh, the waist hip ratio uh, genes in your uh, mm -hmm. study. Did you find much of an overlap? Um, there was quite a bit of overlap. I had the slide towards the beginning of mm. my presentation where it showed how many of my loci um, were also found for BMI and waist hip ratio and then other obese phenotypes in the GWAS catalogue. Um, I'm not sure I can recall the exact numbers, but out of almost a thousand independent loci, there was something like 100 that were discoverable for BMI, 50 odd loci for waist hip ratio, and then quite a few that were already reported in the literature. I guess with the DEXA, you're, you might be measuring different things with. As we're opposed hoping to, waist we're hip hoping ratio to capture something further, yes. Yeah, some, yeah, okay. Um, Masaru Kato asks Is TSD also involved in cachexia in cancer, cancer patients? The cancer oh, uh, yeah, I, I don't know the answer to that. So, you know, rapid uh, fat loss with cachexia, um, we, we, we certainly haven't looked at that. It's certainly be worth looking. So there's a quest, question from Jeffrey Vernon, again on, on TST, um, asking um, in the overexpression whether the improvement of glucose, homeost that, that scale of glucose homeostasis improvement um, is uh you know sufficient if you're thinking about drug targets so is it a strong enough effect for it to be a drug target do you think i mean you did show um, some drug responsiveness didn't you um, yeah so yeah i mean we showed that, that the substrate for tst worked uh it protected against diabetes and that that was tst dependent not data didn't show today but that's been published um is it sufficient a, a target it's a good question because, you know, as people get obese, the TST levels would be going down, so the target would be going down. So in that sense, there might be some confounding. Um, but TST is also highly expressed in the liver. In fact, most highly expressed in the liver and other places. So you may get beneficial effects there. Uh, and along with, you know, a program of weight loss that would gradually increase TST, it might be a useful target. I think everyone really just wants to focus on the drugs that exist, you know, like metformin and all the rest of it for diabetes. but Many people don't respond well to that, and I think there's still scope to, to look for new therapeutic um, pathways in, in, for, for diabetes or obesity associated diabetes. Whether industry has an appetite for developing new drugs is another question. And so it's all just getting getting the interest high enough to develop it. There's, there's no reason to that I can think of that it wouldn't be as effective as metformin if it was given in the right conditions and in the right way. But whether you get the interest to do those very large studies that would prove it is, is another matter. Okay. Um, uh, with the Swami uh, Balas Subramanian um, is asking a question about um, uh, TST in uh, South Indian South Asians, um, where uh, they saw a, a lean phenotype with metabolic obesity profiles. I just wondered, um, would there be any role of this of TST in this phenotype? Has any work yeah. been done in other populations? Or? 
you know, so the, the populations we've looked at were uh, a Spanish population and Icelandic, quite a large Icelandic population from the ages cohort, and then some smaller cohorts that we did in, locally in, in Scotland. And it seemed to, to fit that uh, lean people and lean healthy people in particular, so the associations with metabolic health and leanness rather than what might be uh, partial lipodystrophy. And we've never looked in that kind of person uh, or, or rodent model, so I don't know the answer to that. And we haven't looked in those other populations, so it's definitely worth worth looking at. Thank you. Now, Catherine, you mentioned at the end of your talk that there could be a, a mechanism involving inflammation. I wondered if you wanted to say any more about that. Yes, of course. Um, so um, I didn't really have the time to cover it, but um, we're seeing in the MPX knockout mice after the high fat diet exposure, we're um, seeing a shortening of their gut length, um, which was one of the only anatomical differences that we saw, um, which could be um, linked to an inflammatory response to the high fat diet itself. But that's all just theoretical and there's more work that we need to do to figure that out for sure. Um, okay, so we're getting near the end of the uh, questions. There was another one on leptin, but I think um, you've answered that. You've, already, you've looked uh, potentially at leptin levels in these models. But um, there's some general uh, questions um, around obesity, and um, either of you, do you think we're anywhere near solving the obesity crisis? Well, uh, um, I, I can give I can give my my 10 pence worth but I, you yeah. know, I, I, it, it doesn't look like it I mean everything's on hold at the moment uh, because of COVID but one of the things that I normally show the, the diagram I showed you of the prevalence um, where you get we're getting to 40 percent is a very schematic catch-all diagram but it seems to be true across the board for, for you know, developed countries and developing countries but it seems to be plateauing and that's the intriguing thing for me it got me started on the journey in the first place looking for lean genes is that implies that 60% of the population who are, you know, subjected to that obesity onslaught are are resistant, and there may be people in there who have uh, similar mechanisms to elevated TST, which doesn't turn out to be a human genetic mechanism, but something like that, where people who are intrinsically lean uh, are have genetic mechanisms that we could exploit uh, to look at the other the other side of that equation. Um, so I don't think we're we are anywhere near uh, tackling it, I think it's going to be a contribution, a combination, sorry, of lifestyle and uh, potential um, pharmacological and surgery, which, which does seem to be extremely effective in, in these patients, but is, is quite inv invasive. Yeah, thank you. Um, well, I think, I think we've covered most of the, uh, of the questions, um, so we can um, perhaps uh, draw the session to a close now. Um, I wanted to uh, uh, thank everyone for attending and, and for our two speakers um, for two excellent uh, talks. Um, you can continue the conversation online if you follow at uh, Bike MSOC and at PP Publishing on Twitter. Um, as I said at the beginning, uh, we welcome suggestions for future topics and speakers to feature in this biochemistry focus webinar series. If you've got an idea, submit a proposal. Um, have a look on the biochemistry.org website uh, for information. You'll be able to see how to put a proposal together. Um, the next in this webinar series is Careers in Science, Communication, Medical Writing and Engagement on Thursday the 4th, February at 1400 chaired by uh, Robbie Baldock, Senior Lecturer in Biochemistry at Solent University, and a member of the Biochemical Society's Research Area for Genes. Um, and there'll be three speakers who work in this field and attendees will have the opportunity to ask questions. Um, okay, well, thank you very much uh, again, Nick and Catherine, for two very enjoyable talks. Uh, it was a very good uh, uh, seminar. Thank you very much. Thank you and thanks for the Thank questions. You.